Yeah. Sorry, we're good. just give us a second. I'm just pouring his first water here. Ladies and gentlemen, you're all extremely welcome to tonight's event, which we're all very excited and very proud to bring you here at the Literary and Historical Society and the Philosophy Society. Before we introduce to you Professor Noam Chomsky, I'd like to introduce our guest chairperson for this evening. He is a foreign affairs correspondent with the Irish Times, has also corresponded from Northern Ireland. He tells me he's very widely travelled and has interviewed, amongst others, Yasser Arafat and Kofi Annan. He's also the author of Far Side of Revenge, about the politics of Northern Ireland, and Shkaloga, a collection of short stories. Ladies and gentlemen, could you give a very warm welcome to Deglon de Bredu. Um, first of all, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Would you please uh, switch off your mobile phones uh, completely and utterly, uh, or you will be damned forever. Uh, you will be rendered up to George Bush or whoever else will have you. Um, I was here on Tuesday night, and uh, I don't see them tonight, but uh, there was a very evocative series of pictures of UCD history uh, because I happen to be a former member of the LNH and a former UCD student. And uh, I think there was a picture of the meeting in the Great Hall addressed by jo the late John Feeney uh, during the Gentle Revolution. And I think I'm a, I'm a zelig, a kind of a speck uh, in that picture, just as I am a kind of a zelig or a super zelig here tonight uh, for, the, for the, 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 great, the great man. Um, but I couldn't help uh, being reminded of, of those days when dissent was very, uh, a very chancy undertaking in Ireland. Uh, it still is to some extent, but in those days it was really chancy. And uh, there were great figures at UCD and outside it, people like the late Fergal O'Connor, uh, a little spoken of uh, lecturer uh, who unfortunately didn't stay with us, called Michael Chestnut. Uh, some people may remember him. And outside in the big, the big world, there were people like Noel Brown. And I can remember the thrill of excitement and the sheer, uh, the danger, uh, the thrill of danger and excitement when you would go to a meeting addressed by one of these people who were uh, not quite as badly treated as Václav Havel or whoever, but they were certainly not respected by the society that we had then. And I think that uh, trying to fathom the attraction uh, of Noam Chomsky and the extraordinary turnout that he has got on this trip, uh, I suppose the fundamental attraction of Noam Chomsky is that he is uh, the dissident's dissident and he is never afraid to take a stand, however unpopular, and to call uh, things as he sees them, whether it's on Iran and nuclear weapons, on Shannon, on uh, uh, other controversial issues down through the years, on the, the horrors of 9-11, but the, 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 the deeper causes of that. And uh, I, I, I suppose that's, that's 
That's why you're all here. Um, if I may make a small claim to fame, uh, my footnote in history for this event is that uh, I am told by the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, privately that if it wasn't for an article I wrote, he probably wouldn't be here. Uh, you will all remember, or you will all be aware, I'm sure, that uh, Professor Chomsky uh, actually discovered at the last minute that his passport was out of date. Uh, anybody who makes any jokes about absent-minded professors will be immediately removed from the hall. But uh, uh, as it happened, uh, another organ uh, of the media, which I won't name, uh, uh, had reported uh, Mr. Chomsky as saying that he described Bertie Ahern as a shoeshine boy for George Bush. Uh, when I checked it out, uh, I discovered that he never said that at all, that he was actually talking about uh, leaders in Eastern Europe, uh, what Don Rumsfeld calls the old Europe, or the new Europe, who had supported uh, the war in Iraq. Uh, I, I managed to correct this and put it in the Irish Times and uh, I know, uh, I, in fact, I was told by a source very close to the minister yesterday that that uh, minister had read it and had taken it into account uh, in his decision to intervene, uh, to intervene uh, on Mr. Chom Dr. Chomsky's behalf uh, to secure his arrival in Ireland, even though uh, Dr. Chomsky and the minister would definitely not see uh, eye to eye on, 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 uh, on world affairs. So um, I, I, um, I think it's, it's fair to say that he, needs, he really needs no introduction. He is uh, a groundbreaking uh, uh, expert and theoretician on linguistics uh, who later turned to, uh, decided to take a political stand beginning with uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, I'm particularly interested in his views on uh, the Barcelona anarchists in the 1930s, I, uh, but I don't know if he'll have time to go into that. I'm also very interested in his views on the role of multinationals, now that multinationals are so, so much a part of, uh, of, of Ireland's day-to-day uh, -day life. I find his views on the mass media uh, fascinating, uh, although I, I think I managed to prove this week that there, there are mass media and mass media. Uh, in other words, there are different versions of Chomsky in different outlets, but I wouldn't want to make too much of that. So, uh, I, uh, as I say, to conclude, I'm uh, very much struck by the extraordinary uh, turnout for Dr. Chomsky and the amazing demand for tickets from the young people. I haven't seen anything like it, and I don't mean to disparage either of them by this, since the Pope's visit. And uh, <laughs> I don't expect Dr. Chomsky to say, uh, young people of Ireland, I love you. But uh, it's clear that the young people of Ireland love him. Uh, would you welcome, please, Dr. Noam Chomsky. A century ago, in uh, July 1955, uh, Bertrand Russell and uh, Alfred Einstein uh, issued a, uh, a, a, an extraordinary appeal to the people of the world, uh, asking them, quote, to set aside the strong feelings they have about many issues and consider yourselves only as members of a biological species which has had a remarkable history and whose disappearance none of us can desire. Uh, we face a choice, they said, that is stark and dreadful and inescapable. Shall we put an end to the human race or shall mankind renounce war? Well, war has not been renounced, of course. Uh, quite the contrary, the uh, world's 
hegemonic power uh, accords itself the right to wage war at will under a doctrine called anticipatory self-defense with unstated bounds. And it's backed in that stance by uh, the spear carrier for Pax Americana, as Blair's Britain is described by a former NATO planner, Michael McGuire, in the Journal of uh, Britain's Royal Institute of International Affairs, uh, the pillion passenger of American policy, as the Institute describes uh, Britain elsewhere. Uh, the uh, Russell Einstein warning is no less stark after half a century of denial. Uh, there have been efforts to uh, strengthen the thin thread on which survival hangs. Now, the most important is the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, NPT, which came into force in 1970, in good part on Irish initiative, I recently learned 10 minutes ago. Uh, on the uh, 50th anniversary of the appeal, uh, of the uh, Russell Einstein appeal, the regular five-year uh, review uh, conference of the NPT, there is one every five years, uh, it took place, that's last May in New York. Uh, a leading concern of participants and close observers was Washington's intent, I'm quoting, intent to remo uh, remove the nuclear brakes, taking a big and dangerous step that will lead to the transformation of the nuclear bomb into a legitimate weapon for waging war. That's quoting one of uh, Israel's leading military analysts, uh, Ruven Pedatsur. Uh, that was a significant factor, in fact, the main factor in the dismal failure of the review conference, which may, in fact, mean its end. Uh, I'll come back to these ominous developments, uh, which were barely reported in the United States. Uh, don't know what happened here and uh, little appreciated among the general public. Uh, that uh, thin thread on which survival hangs uh, has almost snapped since the Russell-Einstein uh, appeal, uh, repeatedly, in fact. The best-known case is the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962. Uh, the escape from nuclear oblivion seems miraculous uh, two of the most promise, uh, prominent researchers uh, recently concluded in a book about it. Uh, there was a retrospective conference in Havana in the year 2002, October 2002, and at that conference, uh, the historian, well-known historian and uh, Kennedy advisor, uh, Arthur Schlesinger, described the missile crisis as the most dangerous moment in human history. Uh, participants in the conference learned to their amazement that the dangers were even more severe than they had believed. <clears throat> they discovered at the conference that the world was literally one word away from the first use of a nuclear weapon uh, since Nagasaki. The one word uh, was that of a Russian submarine commander, uh, Vasily Arkhipov, who should receive many Nobel Peace Prizes, uh, he countermanded an order to fire uh, nuclear-armed torpedoes when uh, uh, the Russian submarines were under attack by U.S. destroyers and the commanders believed that a nuclear war was underway. Uh, had he fired that nuclear-armed weapon, uh, the consequences could have been dreadful, in fact, terminal. Uh, these... Uh, Revelations in October 2002 received very scant reporting, uh, bare mention in the national press, and very little interest. Uh, that would have been uh, remarkable at any time, but it was uh, particularly so at that moment. Uh, that moment was described as the most dangerous time since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, it's uh, Michael Crepon, who was the founder of uh, the Strategic Studies Center in Washington, the Stimson Institute. 
Uh, the U.S. and uh, Britain had at that time, as you know, just virtually announced their plans to invade Iraq, uh, knowing full well that the attack would probably uh, uh, escalate uh, terror and nuclear proliferation, as in fact it did. And it was also no secret at that time that a major contributory factor uh, to the 1962 uh, brush with disaster was a topic that was uh, of uh, great concern, a prime concern, uh, right at the moment of the 2002 uh, conference, namely uh, international terrorism. In 1962, the Kennedy campaign uh, to bring uh, the terrors of the earth to Cuba uh, was a factor in the major factor in the crisis. The phrase terrors of the earth is that of uh, uh, Arthur Schlesinger again the, in his biography of uh, Robert Kennedy and according to Schlesinger to bring the terrors of the earth to Cuba was uh, Robert Kennedy's highest concern. He was the in charge of the uh, terrorist war, uh, which was put on hold briefly during the missile crisis and uh, resumed immediately after the crisis subsided. Uh, one of the high-level planners who attended the Havana retrospective was uh, Kennedy's defense secretary, Robert McNamara, and he recalled that the world, in his words, came within a hair's breadth of nuclear disaster during the missile crisis. And he accompanied this reminder with a warning, uh, namely a warning of what he called apocalypse soon. He described current U.S. nuclear weapons policy as immoral, illegal, militarily unnecessary, and dreadfully dangerous, creating unacceptable risks to other nations and to our own, both the risk of accidental or inadvertent nuclear launch which is unacceptably high, and of nuclear attack by terrorists. He endorsed the judgment of uh, Clinton's Secretary of Defense, William Perry, that his words again, there's a greater than 50% probability of a nuclear strike on U.S. targets uh, within a decade. And those threats are being escalated, in fact consciously escalated, by the U.S. and Britain, the Iraq invasion is only the most uh, glaring example. The, uh, uh, there's a consensus in the U.S. government's uh, intelligence uh, command uh, that, the, uh, uh, that a dirty bomb attack, nuclear bomb attack, a dirty nuclear bomb attack is inevitable, in their words, and an attack with a devastating nuclear weapon is highly likely if fissionable materials, which are the essential ingredient, are not retrieved and secured and their further production controlled. I'll come back to the critical question of controlling production, uh, very much on the front pages today, but in the wrong context, uh, there, which I'll get to. Uh, there had been some success in retrieving and securing fissionable, fissionable materials since the early 1990s, that was under the initiatives of two U.S. Senators, uh, Sam Nunn and Richard Lugar. Uh, but these programs were put on the shelf by the uh, new Bush administration. Uh, they uh, were not interested in the programs to avert uh, what the intelligence community called inevitable nuclear terror, uh, just as they sidelined the so-called war on terror uh, so that they could devote their energies to uh, driving the country to war, and then to efforts to contain somehow the catastrophe that uh, they had created in Iraq. Uh, in the Journal of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, which is as respectable as you can get and not given to hyperbole, uh, two prominent strategic analysts uh, warned recently that the Bush administration military programs and its aggressive stance carry, in their words, an appreciable risk of ultimate doom. And they explain the reasons, which are straightforward. Uh, pursuit of total security by one state, including the right to wage war at will, 
and to release the nuclear brakes. Uh, that entails the insecurity of others who are likely to react. And they will make use of the terrifying technology that's now being developed in uh, what Donald Rumsfeld calls the transformation of the military. <clears throat> and they point out that that technology will assuredly diffuse to the rest of the world. And in the context of competition in intimidation, there's an action-reaction cycle which creates, quote them, rising danger, a potentially an unmanageable one, hence transformation as currently being practiced carries an appreciable risk of ultimate doom. Ultimate doom means terminal. Human species is over. Uh, the uh, 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 authors express the hope that the threat that the U.S. government is posing to its own population and to the world will be countered by a coalition of peace-loving states uh, led by China. Uh, we've come to a pretty pass when thoughts like that are expressed right at the heart of the establishment. Uh, they bring up China for a good reason. It's because of all the nuclear states. Uh, it has maintained by far the most restrained pattern of military deployment. These are quotes all the way through. Uh, furthermore, <clears throat> China has led the efforts at the United Nations to block the unilateral U.S. refusal to preserve space for peaceful purposes. That's since the Clinton years. The Clinton administration refused to join the call of the entire world, uh, apart from Israel, uh, in renewal and extension of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which does reserve space for peaceful, peaceful purposes. And they immobilized the UN Disarmament Commission by barring outright uh, any moves towards prevention of an arms race in outer space. Uh, Clinton's Space Command explained the reasons. Uh, they called for, quoting the Space Command, dominating the space dimension of military operations to protect U.S. interests and investment, uh, much in the way that armies and navies had done so in earlier years but now with a sole uh, hegemon, no competition. Uh, the United States, which must develop space-based strike weapons, enabling the application of precision force from, to, and through space. Uh, U.S. intelligence and the Space Command uh, during the Clinton years agreed, and their analysis is worth paying close attention to, uh, they agreed that such measures will be necessary because globalization of the world economy will lead to a widening economic divide along with deepening economic stagnation, political instability, and cultural alienation, hence unrest and violence among the have-nots, uh, much of it directed against the United States. So therefore, the United States must be ready for precision strike from space as a counter to the worldwide proliferation of uh, weapons of mass destruction by unruly elements. That's a likely consequence of the recommended military programs, uh, just as the widening divide and increasing unrest is the anticipated consequence of the specific version of international integration that's misleadingly called the uh, globalization or free trade and the doctrinal system. Well, the danger to everyone else uh, is becoming even more serious as the Bush administration uh, extended Clinton's doctrine. Clinton's doctrine was control of space for military purposes. Uh, the Bush administration extended it, I'm quoting, to ownership of space, which means instant engagement anywhere in the world. Uh, that puts the entire world at risk of instant destruction thanks to sophisticated global surveillance and offensive weaponry in space. Uh, Bush's uh, extension of the Clinton space doctrine uh, was one implementation of the national security strategy 
announced in September 2002, the Space Command quotes are from shortly after, uh, the national security strategy uh, declared uh, what was called a new grand imperial, a new imperial grand strategy. That's what it was called in the, in a critical article immediately in the leading establishment journal, Foreign Affairs. Well, as would be expected, uh, Russia reacted to Pentagon reports about militarization of space by announcing that it would consider using force if necessary to respond. Uh, similarly, as had been anticipated, uh, Russia had reacted to Bush's vast increase in offensive military capacity by sharply increasing its own capacities aimed at the United States. That's the action-reaction cycle which everyone knows about. Uh, China was expected to follow uh, what's called missile defense, which on all sides is understood to be a first strike weapon. Uh, that's a particularly severe danger to China. Uh, if the programs, there's a lot of talk about the programs not working, but that's missing the point. As long as they don't work, they're not a problem. If they show any sign of success, then we're in trouble uh, because China is likely to expand its offensive uh, capacities to preserve its deterrent. In fact, that's a near certainty, which means more offensive missiles with uh, multiple warheads aimed at the United States. Uh, in uh, the immediate consequence of any success in missile defense. Uh, in 2004, the United States accounted for 95 percent of total global military space expenditures, uh, but others may join if they're compelled to do so. Uh, both U.S. and China Chinese analysts interpret all this in very similar terms. So U.S. analysts describe uh, current the programs current, currently under development by Washington as uh, a significant move by the United States towards weaponization of space and point out that space facing of weapons is very likely to have a negative effect on the national security of the United States. That's from the Naval War College Review. Uh, a Chinese analyst, now visiting Harvard as a visiting fellow, uh, he writes that uh, to China and to many other countries, the construction of these systems looks like the development of the Death Star spaceship in the Star Wars film series, which can be used to attack military and civilian satellites and targets anywhere, uh, anywhere on Earth. The deployment of space weapons, which everyone understands to be first strike weapons, is likely to lead China and others uh, to uh, develop low-cost space weapons in reaction. So the U.S. policy, still quoting him, could trigger an arms race in space. Uh, furthermore, he writes that to protect against the potential loss of its deterrent capability, uh, China could also resort to building up its nuclear forces which, in, which would set off a ripple effect. It would encourage, uh, in fact, almost compel India to do the same. Uh, that would have an effect on Pakistan, uh, then spreads without limit. Uh, Russia had already announced that it would do so, as I said. Uh, others understand as well uh, the same conclusions. So senior military and uh, space officials of the European Union, uh, Canada, China, and Russia, recently published a statement objecting to these Bush administration plans, uh, writing that the psychological impact of a blow from space might rival that of devastating attacks, such devastating attacks as Hiroshima, and just as the unleashing of nuclear weapons had unforeseen consequences, so too would the weaponization of space. Uh, Michael McGuire, the former, former NATO planner, uh, continues the article I was talking about with some very important information that's not well known. Uh, he, uh, this is from the years when he was a NATO planner, uh, he, uh, same writing in the British Journal of Inter International Affairs, the Royal Institute Journal, uh, he reminds us that in 1986, uh, recognizing what he calls the dreadful logic of nuclear weapons, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev called for their total elimination. 
But that proposal foundered on Reagan's militarization of space programs and called Star Wars informally. Uh, at the time, NATO doctrine was explicitly premised on the credible threat of first use of nuclear weapons, and that continues to be policy today. Uh, Russia kept to the same doctrine until 1994, when it reversed its stand and adopted a no first use policy and called for elimination of nuclear weapons. However, uh, Russia reverted to the NATO doctrine and abandoned its call for abolition of nuclear weapons in response to a very important act of Clinton's, which is little known, uh, namely the expansion of NATO to the east. That was violating a firm commitment by Washington, a categorical assurance, in fact, to Gorbachev that if Gorbachev would agree to a rearmed Germany, reunited Germany, remaining totally in NATO, then the NATO alliance would not expand eastwards to absorb for, uh, former members of the Warsaw Pact. That was the categorical assurance. Well, in the light of uh, earlier history or just uh, strategic uh, truisms, uh, Clinton's violation of these firm pledges uh, posed a very serious security threat to Russia. Uh, and uh, uh, that explains Clinton's violation of the pledge, explains why NATO also rejected Russian proposals for a nuclear weapons-free zone encompassing Central Europe from the Arctic to the Baltic Sea. Uh, that would have interfered with Clinton's plans to expand, expand NATO to the east in violation of the firm commitment not to do so. Uh, all of that, obviously, uh, enhanced the likelihood of apocalypse soon. But that has never been a high priority for planners, neither Clinton or Bush. Uh, senator Nunn, who I mentioned before, a conservative senator, highly respected figure who's played a leading role in efforts to reduce the threat of nuclear war, uh, he wrote recently in the British Financial Times uh, that the chances for an accidental, uh, mistaken, or unauthorized nuclear attack uh, might be increasing. As a result of policy choices that leave America's survival dependent on accuracy of Russia's warning systems and its command and control, we are uh, running an unnecessary risk of an Armageddon of our own making, he wrote. Uh, what Nunn is referring to is the very sharp expansion of US military programs, uh, which tilt the strategic balance sharply in ways that uh, essentially make Russia, quoting him, make Russia more likely to launch upon warning of an attack without waiting to see if the warning is accurate, because they'll have no choice. And that threat is enhanced by the fact that the Russian early warning system is in serious disrepair, along with the collapse of the Russian economy in the 1990s, and therefore more likely to give a false warning of incoming missiles. Uh, US reliance on high alert, hair trigger, nuclear posture allows missiles to be launched within minutes, actually three minutes, uh, forcing our leaders to decide almost instantly whether to launch nuclear weapons uh, once they have a warning of attack, uh, robbing them of the time they might need to gather data, exchange information, uh, and generally uh, assess the uh, situation, gain some perspective, discover errors. Uh, we know that that's happened hundreds of times for the US systems, and the anticipated uh, Russian reaction to the Bush administration, aggressive militarism increases the risk of an Armageddon of our own making well beyond even that intolerable level. Now that's Senator Nunn, uh, a, a very conservative and respected figure, I should say. Uh, there's a related concern, which was discussed in the uh, technical literature well before 9-11. That is that uh, nuclear weapons uh, may 
sooner or later fall into the hands of terrorist groups. And those prospects are also being advanced by Bush administration planners and their British counterparts uh, who simply do not give terrorism a high priority as they regularly demonstrate. Uh, their aggressive militarism has not only led Russia to significantly expand its offensive capacities, as soon have the same effect on China, uh, but it's also inducing the Russians uh, to uh, transfer nuclear weapons constantly across Russia's vast territory to counter mounting U.S. threats from every side. That's well known. Uh, Washington planners are also surely aware that Chechen rebels uh, who had already stolen radioactive materials from nuclear waste plants and power stations, uh, but that they have also been uh, casing the railway systems and special trains designed for shipping uh, nuclear weapons across Russia. That's quoting Harvard University strategic analyst Graham Allison. Uh, Bruce Blair, former Minuteman officer, uh, director of the Center for Defense Information in Washington, uh, he estimates that every day uh, many hundreds of Russian nuclear weapons are moving across the countryside. And theft of one nuclear bomb, he says, could spell eventual disaster for an American city. Uh, but this is not the worst case scenario stemming from this nuclear gamesmanship. Uh, more ominously, he concludes, the seizure of a ready-to-fire strategic long-range nuclear missile or a group of missiles could be apocalyptic for entire nations. And all of this is imminent. could happen tomorrow. Uh, another major threat is that uh, terrorist hackers might break into military communication networks and transmit uh, launch orders for missiles armed with hundreds of nuclear weapons. And that's no fantasy. The Pentagon learned that a few years ago when serious uh, defects were discovered uh, in its own safeguards, which are much more advanced than those of the Russians, uh, that required new instructions to be constructed for Trident submarine launch crews. Uh, systems in other countries, uh, particularly the recent proliferators, are much less reliable. Uh, all of that creates uh, what Blair calls an accident waiting to happen, an accident that could be apocalyptic. Uh, these dangers are consciously being escalated, consciously, by the threat and use of violence, which, as long predicted, is stimulating nuclear proliferation, along with the uh, jihadi terrorism that uh, traces back to the Reagan administration programs to uh, organize, train, and arm uh, radical uh, Islamists, uh, not for the defense of Afghanistan, as proclaimed, but for the usual and ugly reasons of state, uh, which had grave consequences for the tormented people of Afghanistan uh, and also for Pakistanis and the world, as the Reagan administration cheerfully tolerated Pakistan's slide towards uh, radical Islamist extremism uh, under the rule of Zia al Huq, who was one of the many brutal dictators uh, supported by Washington and London in the 1980s. It's pretty much the present incumbents. Uh, Reagan and associates uh, looked away politely uh, while their ally was developing nuclear weapons uh, the Reagan administration annually endorsed the pretense that Pakistan was not doing so. Uh, the only threat remotely comparable to nuclear weapons is environmental catastrophe, uh, also far too serious to ignore. Uh, as you know, there was a G8 summit meeting in uh, Scotland last summer. Uh, right before the meeting, the scientific academies of all G8 nations, that includes the National Academy of Sciences in the United States. Uh, they were also joined by the National Academies of China, India, and Brazil. Uh, they issued a statement calling on the leaders of the rich countries uh, to take uh, urgent action to head off this potential disaster. 
the uh, London Financial Times endorsed what they called this clarion call while deploring the fact that, reading their leader, uh, there is, however, one holdout, and unfortunately it is to be found in the White House, where George W. Bush insists we still do not know enough about this literally world-changing phenomenon. Uh, Washington then succeeded in removing language, calling for prompt action to control global warming and eliminating such inflammatory statements as our world is warming. Uh, the reason they said is because uh, Mr. Bush has said that global warming is too uncertain a matter to justify anything more than voluntary measures. And the end result, the editors continue, is that little remained in the G8, G8 statement other than pious waffle. That all reveals again how the famous uh, moral clarity of, the, of our leaders uh, extends to the fate of their grandchildren. Uh, it's important to stress government here. The, there's a standard observation, which I'm sure you've read, uh, that the United States uh, stands almost alone in rejecting the uh, Kyoto Protocols. Now, that statement is correct if the phrase United States excludes its population. The population strongly favors the Kyoto Pact, overwhelming majority. In fact, support for it is so strong that over half of Bush's supporters uh, believe that he supported it because it's so obvious. Uh, more generally, uh, voters are s seriously deluded about the positions of political parties. That's not because of lack of interest or uh, mental incapacity, but it's because elections are carefully designed uh, to yield that result. That also matters that uh, bear quite directly on uh, functioning democracy and uh, indirectly on survival of the species. Well, McGuire writes further that under current policies, a nuclear exchange is ultimately inevitable. Uh, if present tendencies persist, we are virtually certain to see a return to nuclear arms racing uh, involving intercontinental ballistic missiles and space-based assets, uh, reactivating the danger of inadvertent nuclear war with a probability that will be extremely high. Uh, these, incidentally, are almost random samples from the general strategic analysis literature. Uh, as a step towards uh, reducing the danger, Maguire urges Britain, his own country, uh, to abandon its useless nuclear weapons, uh, which he calls the lace curtains of our political poverty. Uh, but the crucial choices everyone knows are in Washington, uh, or more properly, uh, in the public arena if the critical failures of uh, contemporary Western democracy uh, can be overcome. Uh, Maguire's immediate concern in this article I've been quoting in the Royal Institute Journal, his immediate concern was the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the May 2005 uh, five-year review conference. Uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty was based on two, it was a bargain, it was based on two central agreements. Uh, the uh, uh, non-nuclear states would renounce the option of acquiring nuclear weapons, uh, and uh, they were promised in return, first, unimpeded access to nuclear energy for non-military use, and second, uh, progress on total nuclear disarmament by the nuclear weapon states. At the May 2005 conference, uh, Washington's goal was to rescind both promises. Uh, that stand naturally reinforces what McGuire calls the cynical view that uh, whatever the original intentions, the non-proliferation treaty is now a convenient instrument of US foreign policy. Uh, Washington's main demand, and that is on the front pages now, uh, has to do with Article 4 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, Washington wants it re uh, revised and uh, restricted. 
Uh, and there's a good case that can be made for that. They're right, I agree with them. Uh, Article 4 grants non-nuclear states the right to produce fuel for reactors. Now that made good sense in 1970. Uh, that's when the NPT came into force. But since then there's been a lot of technological advance uh, and it, with contemporary technology, uh, fuel for reactors is just a bare step away from nuclear weapons. So it makes sense to modify and restrict Article 4. However, any such restriction of Article 4 has to include and guarantee uh, the same unimpeded access for non-military use in accordance with the initial bargain. And there are proposals how to do that. A reasonable proposal was put forth by Mohammed al baradei He's the head of the International Atomic Energy Agencies, the 2005 Nobel Peace Laureate. Uh, his proposal several years ago is that all uh, production and processing of weapons usable material be restricted exclusively to facilities under multinational control accompanied above all by an assurance that uh, legitimate would-be users would get their supplies for nuclear energy and that he says should be the first step towards uh, fully implementing a 1993 UN resolution uh, calling for a fissile material cutoff treaty informally called FISBAN, uh, banning fissile material production, uh, a treaty that would cap and make public all inventories of fissile materials still available, then leading on to the promised total disarmament. Well, El Baradei's proposal was quite reasonable and it would take a long step towards preserving the species, but it was regrettably dead in the water. Uh, the U.S. political leadership, uh, surely in its current stance or any alternative on the horizon, uh, would never agree to abrogate uh, its unique exemption from international law and treaty obligations. Uh, so Washington's call for restricting Article 4 uh, with regard to Iran uh, is therefore uh, regarded by most of the world uh, quite rationally as just the cynical uh, in, in, uh, intention to convert the NPT into a convenient instrument of U.S. foreign policy. Now, U.S. specialists have proposed uh, other proposals, uh, advanced other proposals. Some of them are quite detailed. I'm not going to review them. Uh, but they all have one fundamental flaw. Uh, they require faith in Washington's benign intentions. And evidently, that's not going to go anywhere uh, outside of uh, Washington and 10 Downing Street, uh, maybe here, I don't know. Uh, media coverage of the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in May was very scanty in the United States. It kept very much to Washington's agenda. So as the conference opened, the New York Times reported that, it, that the conference was meant to offer hope of closing huge loopholes in the treaty, which the United States says Iran and North Korea have exploited uh, to pursue nuclear weapons. That's referring to Article 4. So in brief, Washington's agenda, not shared by the world, nor shared by prominent strategic analysts. Uh, the news report on the opening sessions focused almost entirely on Washington's demand that Iran dismantle all the equipment and facilities, I'm quoting now, and the quotation's interesting, dismantle all the uh, facility, equipment and facilities it has built uh, during the past two decades to manufacture nuclear material. Uh, both American officials, uh, American officials have said that they were concerned that as Iran's June elections draw nearer, a politically popular drive to restart the nuclear program uh, may accelerate. Well, that's an interesting wording if you think about it. Uh, notice first the uh, casual recognition of the Bush administration's fear of democracy, uh, hence the urgency to nullify expression of uh, Iranian popular will. Uh, but more interesting than that is the interesting phrase 
the past two decades. Uh, why are they concerned about the past two decades? Well, the selected time span since 1979 avoids an uncomfortable fact, namely that the policies that Washington now condemns are the very same policies that the U.S. supported uh, before the 1979 overthrow of the Shah. That's uh, the tyrant who was uh, imposed by the United States and Britain in a military coup in 1953 that destroyed parliamentary democracy in Iran, overthrown in 1979. So today the standard claim is that Iran has no need for nuclear power, so it must be pursuing a secret weapons program. Uh, quote Henry Kissinger, for an oil producer such as Iran, nuclear energy is a waste, wasteful use of resources. That's Henry Kissinger today. Uh, when the Shah was in charge, uh, and Henry Kissinger was Secretary of State, uh, his, he's uh, declared that introduction of nuclear power uh, will both provide for the growing needs of Iran's economy and free remaining oil reserves for export or conversion to petrochemicals. And the U.S. acted to uh, uh, accelerate those efforts with uh, Cheney, uh, Wolfowitz, Rumsfeld, and others playing a significant role. Uh, U.S. universities were arranging to train Iranian nuclear engineers, uh, doubtless with Washington's approval, probably with Washington's direct initiative. Uh, that included my own university, MIT, where the policies went through despite overwhelming student opposition, about 80 percent, big crisis on campus. Uh, well, asked about his reversal, uh, Kissinger responded with his uh, usual engaging frankness. He said, well, then they were an allied country, and therefore they had a genuine need for nuclear energy pre-1979, uh, but now they have no such need because they're an enemy. Uh, uh, Washington's charges about an Iranian nuclear program uh, may for once be accurate. Uh, as many analysts have, has, have observed, it would be remarkable if they were not. Uh, it was predicted by strategic analysts that the U.S.-U.K. invasion of Iraq uh, would increase uh, not only terror, uh, but also nuclear proliferation, as indeed happened, confirmed by intelligence agencies in both cases. Uh, reviewing these conclusions, one of Israel's leading military historians, Martin von Krefeld, uh, writes that after the invasion of Iraq, had the Iranians not tried to build nuclear weapons, they would be crazy. Uh, Washington has gone out of its way to instruct Iran on the need for a powerful deterrent, not only by invading Iraq, but also by strengthening the offensive forces of its Israeli client, which already has hundreds of nuclear weapons, and uh, though a small country, it's an offshoot of the United States, uh, hence, it has uh, air and armored forces, uh, which are larger and technologically more advanced than any NATO power outside the United States. Uh, furthermore, uh, to make the warning more stark, uh, since early 2004, uh, Israel has been receiving the largest shipment in its history of advanced U.S. jet bombers, uh, very publicly advertised as capable of bombing Iran and equipped with unspecified uh, special weaponry, as they're called, and deep penetration bombs, all of this intended for the years of Iranian intelligence who are to make the worst case analysis. Uh, uh, there's uh, another uh, important uh, European Union contribution. Uh, if you can only read one article about the current uh, goings on about Iran, uh, I urge that you read the one that appeared in the London Financial Times uh, yesterday morning by Zelik Harrison, who's one of the major specialists on this, uh, who uh, points out that uh, the nuclear, he points out something which is true, but I don't think has ever been reported before, uh, that at least, you know, in some public journal, he points out that there was an agreement, as you know, between the European Union and Iran 
a couple of years ago, it's now claimed that Iran is backing down from it. Uh, he actually quotes the agreement. Uh, the European Union made a bargain with Iran. Uh, the bargain was that uh, Iran would uh, stop its uh, uh, enrichment of uh, fissile materials, and in return, uh, the European Union uh, would uh, carry out, uh, would enforce, uh, develop and enforce proposals uh, for security guarantees uh, in re uh, for Iran. It would deal with the strategic and security problems of Iran, and everybody knows what that means. It means the U.S.-Israeli threats to bomb Iran. Uh, but under U.S. pressure, the European Union backed off from that. Uh, the uh, uh, Here's quoting the actual agreement. Uh, Iraq, Iran's nuclear program, uh, the, the uh, agreement would provide objective guarantees that Iran's nuclear program is exclusively for peaceful purposes and would equally provide firm commitments on security issues. Well, Europe backed down on that. Uh, the U.S. was opposed. It was unwilling to cooperate with the European Union in formulating concessions to Iran relating to security concerns, and that has the obvious consequence uh, that uh, Iran has no reason to take the agreement seriously. Well, that's uh, European cowardice in this case. Uh, and uh, what it shows is that, uh, uh, again, it's just uh, no way of looking at it except as a cynical intention to advance U.S. foreign policy, Europe agreeing. Uh, well, Iran uh, has options. Uh, it may uh, abandon any hope that Europe could follow an independent and honorable path, just too subservient to the United States, and it may turn to the East, uh, which is perfectly possible. Uh, China is one country that can't be intimidated. That's why the United States is so frightened of China. It's not like Europe. Europe backs down when there are any pressures. China doesn't, continues. In fact, Chinese uh, uh, trade relations with Iran are increasing while Europe, under U.S. pressure, is backing off, uh, selling, it's receiving oil from Iran. Uh, Ch China is also increasing its relations, extending its relations with Saudi Arabia, uh, both military and trade. The U.S. would love to block it, but it can't intimidate China. Uh, Iran might decide to join uh, the Asian energy security grid, based primarily on China and Russia, but with India and Japan and South Korea probably joining, uh, which is an effort to form an independent uh, uh, system for securing energy resources for the fastest growing uh, economic region in the world. Uh, if Iran joins it, it becomes sort of its uh, linchpin. Uh, the, uh, 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 and that, uh, Iran, Iran is being pressed in that direction. It may very well move in that direction. Uh, there are developments in Iraq, uh, which are also proceeding in directions very threatening to U.S. power interests. Uh, there's a lot of talk these days about withdrawal and exit strategies, uh, but most of it is pretty meaningless, and it will remain so. Uh, unless we're able to escape uh, the rigid doctrinal constraints that require right-thinking people uh, to reject with horror uh, what everybody in the world takes for granted outside the West, uh, that uh, the U.S. Inv and Britain invaded Iraq because of its enormous uh, energy resources and to gain uh, even greater control over the uh, energy resources of the Middle East, which back as far as... Uh, 1945, the State Department described as a stupendous source of strategic power and one of the greatest material prizes in world history. It was also recognized back in the 40s that control over these resources would give Washington a veto power over the rest of the industrial world. It was George Kennan, one of the major planners in the late 40s. Uh, and that point has recently been reiterated by one of the more astute of uh, contemporary planners, Vigniew Brzezinski, wasn't particularly in favor of the invasion of Iraq, but he pointed out that if the U.S. can maintain control over Iraq, uh, it will gain critical leverage over its European and Asian 
uh, rivals. Uh, well, the uh, U.S. and Britain uh, will surely do uh, everything they can to ensure that Iraq uh, becomes a reliable client state, uh, much like the U.S. dependencies in Central America or Russia's East European satellites, or for that matter, uh, traditional colonies of the imperial powers. Uh, they are typically run by domestic collaborators, uh, domestic security forces, uh, sometimes even with uh, what are called elections, uh, but with the uh, iron fist of the master visibly clenched and ready for use when needed. It's called sovereignty and independence by the masters. Uh, well, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, surely what the U.S. and Britain are going to try to achieve in the case of Iraq. You can almost hardly doubt that. And uh, the reason is that uh, it's very clear. Uh, if Iraq gains any measure of sovereignty and moderate democracy, its Shiite majority will be dominant. Uh, the major oil reserves are in the Shiite regions, and they're enormous. Uh, they have uh, already, they do have close relations with Iran. They go way back. Uh, many of the very influential clerics, the uh, majority of them, either come from Iran, as uh, Ayatollah Sistani does, or have close relations with Iran. Uh, the major militia, which is mostly running the south, the Badr brigades, was trained in Iran, took part with Iran in the Iran-Iraq war. The relations have since been closer, even with limited sovereignty. Uh, the U.S. can just look on and not do much about it. Uh, furthermore, uh, uh, any limited degree, even of Iraqi sovereignty, is uh, likely to uh, uh, strengthen the efforts of uh, Shiite forces across the border in Saudi Arabia. The regions right near Iraq and Saudi Arabia are mainly Shiite. Uh, they've been bitterly oppressed by the U.S.-backed uh, uh, fundamentalist tyranny and have been seeking a degree of rights, uh, maybe autonomy, that's only going to increase. It already is increasing. And that happens to be where Saudi oil is, most of it. So you can see the prospect that's uh, driving people berserk in Washington and London, undoubtedly. Uh, there's a prospect that uh, the major uh, source of uh, world energy hydrocarbon resources will be in the hands of a loose Shiite alliance, uh, including Saudi Arabia, uh, Iraq, so Shiite Iraq, Shiite Iran, uh, probably with closer links to China already developing, and out of the control of Washington and London. I mean, that would be a nightmare for Washington and London, London almost the ultimate nightmare. And unless these considerations are brought, brought to the forefront, uh, talk about exit and withdrawal strategies and also opposition to occupation don't really mean very much. You've got to escape from the iron grip of doctrine even to talk about these things. Uh, well, since I've lost all my places, I'll have to search for a second. Uh, here we are. Partly the reason is I, there's no light up here. Uh, the uh, primary reason, there's a primary reason why the non-proliferation treaty has uh, collapsed or is facing collapse, uh, and that is the failure of the nuclear states uh, to live up to their own uh, obligations. That's Article 6 of the treaty, which requires the nuclear states, one part of the bargain, uh, to undertake good faith efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons completely. That commitment was underscored by a 1996 World Court decision that they are legally obligated, I'm quoting, to bring to a conclusion negotiations leading to nuclear disarmament in all of its aspects under strict and effective international control. And as long as they refuse, uh, it's unlikely that the bargain will be sustained. NPT will disappear, have a rash of other nuclear states. Uh, El Baradei uh, merely reiterates the obvious, 
uh, when he emphasizes that uh, reluctance by one party to fulfill its obligations uh, will breed reluctance in others. Uh, the, all the nuclear states are guilty in this respect, uh, but the U.S. is far in the lead. It's led the pack in its refusal to abide by Article 6 obligations, and for the first time under Bush, it's officially renounced them. It's said that it is no longer bound by uh, Article 6. It's rescinded the unanimous agreement at the year 2000 review conference for an unequivocal undertaking by the nuclear weapon states to accomplish the total elimination of their nuclear arsenals. At the 2005 conference in May, uh, went further, the uh, rejection of the obligation was explicit and clear. At the close of the conference, uh, the U.S. spokesperson went so far as to say that, quoting him, the treaty requires reduction but not elimination of weapons. It's a transparent falsehood, and it wasn't lost on others. Uh, a central part, another central part of the NPT uh, compact was the commitment uh, of the nuclear powers to enact and implement a series of other treaties. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which was rejected by the Republican Senate in 1999 and was declared off the agenda by Bush. Uh, the ABM Treaty, which Bush rescinded. And most important of all is a verifiable FISBAN, Fissile Fissile Materials Cutoff Treaty. That's the most important. That would prevent further additions, further addition of uh, nuclear bomb material uh, to the already vast amount already existing. Uh, in July 2004, uh, Washington announced its firm opposition to any verifiable FISBAN. Uh, nevertheless, in November of 2004, uh, the United Nations uh, took up the issue and had uh, what I think is the most important vote in its history, maybe to the extent that we have future history in any history. In November 2004, uh, the UN did vote in, favorable, in favor of a verifiable FISBAN. Uh, the vote was uh, 147 to 1 with two abstentions, uh, Israel, which is reflexive, they must vote with the United States, and Britain. Uh, the British ambassador explained uh, his refusal uh, to vote with the overwhelming majority, namely everybody, in favor of this ban. He said that Britain is in favor of it, uh, but this particular version, he said, has divided the international community. Uh, namely, it divided at 147 to 1. Uh, so therefore, the spear carrier couldn't go along. Uh, and that uh, actually gives a lot of insight into the ranking of survival of the species uh, among the priorities of the leadership of the hegemonic power and the pillion passenger and of the media. There was no, in the United States, there was no coverage of this. I, have not found any in Europe. You can tell me if there was any here. Uh, and uh, as that continues, uh, for the rest of us, that means we march along uh, following our leaders to an Armageddon of our own making uh, if we choose to do so. There's nothing inevitable about the choice, and it's a choice that has very grim consequences. Thank you. Sorry, it's not <laughs> See what I'm doing. Can you stay here for questions? Yeah. I'll stay here. Yeah. Well, I wasn't expecting that to be part of my duties as chairman, but you never know. Um, 
Uh, we'll now have a period of questions. Uh, we have about a half an hour. Um, before I start the questions, I'd just like to thank, on your behalf, the people who are doing the sign language here. And, uh, And I want to see how working their butts off comes out in sign language. Um, uh, keep your questions short, please. I studied English here and I learned that a question is an interrogative statement. So let's hear that question mark early. I want a sound bite, not a three course meal. You will be, you should know that Professor Chomsky likes to give fairly detailed answers. <laughs> and we want everyone to get a chance to put their spoke in. Don't be shy about disagreeing with the speaker. He loves a good argument and he spoke admiringly the other night about the per percussive environment of the Middle East. Let's hear the percussive environment of the great tradition of the LNH. First question, please. This is the Please say who you are and if you have any affiliations that we should know about or that you're not afraid to tell us about. Yes, uh, David Edelman. I'm on the faculty here at, um, in Smurfit School. I was also an undergrad at MIT. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the main thing that comes to my mind hearing these uh, overwhelming, uh, seemingly overwhelming issues that you raise is, is the only the hope is public awareness. Um, and I see the universities. Uh, have a role to play there, and, I, and I'm worried at the moment, particularly at universities like this one, um, and I th the recent restructuring that has to do with, um, was, was done by a group over uh, Washington Advisory Group, which is a right-wing think tank, um, with an, a director as a, an advisor to the President of the United States. Uh, I'm worried, in, you know, in situations like that, how, how is that possible? And what are your thoughts on that? Well, I can't really talk about the details of what's happening here. I don't know anything about them, but there's, uh, I know the situation in the United States better, and it's pretty similar in Europe to the extent that I followed it. Uh, there's a lot of pressure towards uh, 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 corporatizing the universities, giving them a kind of a general corporate top-down structure uh, to uh, uh, ensuring that they don't depart too much from, that they don't allow too much uh, a diversity of opinion except well to the right. Uh, that's been going on for years. It's intensifying now. A lot of it is a reaction to uh, what happened in the 1960s. Uh, the 1960s were a democratizing period. Uh, they brought uh, lots of people into the political arena who were usually passive and obedient. And that was terrifying to especially liberal elites. It's not the right wing. If you want to get a picture of it, one of the most important books that everyone should read, if you haven't read it already, uh, is a book called The Crisis of Democracy, which was published in 1974. It's the first, in fact, the only important publication of the Trilateral Commission. Now, that's a commission of liberal internationalists from the trilateral uh, societies, North America, Europe, Japan. Uh, you can get the complexion of it by the fact that they basically filled the Carter administration. It's that spectrum of opinion. Uh, the crisis of democracy that they, uh, that concerned them in all three regions uh, was uh, uh, that there was too much democracy. That normally passive and apathetic populations, you know, young people, women, the elderly, farmers, workers, uh, the groups that are called the special interests, meaning the entire population outside of the corporate sector, uh, the special interests were becoming too engaged in public affairs. And that creates what they called an overload of, on the state. And they therefore called for more moderation in democracy. And they were particularly concerned with what they called, these are their words, the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young. Now that's schools, churches, uh, universities, and so on. They simply weren't doing their job properly. They weren't indoctrinating the young successfully, as you could see from what was happening in the 60s, this wave of openness and democratization and freedom and rights and so on. 
Uh, so therefore, they said they have to do a better job of indoctrinating the young, and if not, the government will have to step in and force them to. Uh, this is, I'm talking from the liberal end of the spectrum. I mean, over on the right, it's far more extreme. And since then, there's been a massive series of efforts to try to achieve these goals. They go all the way from the international economic system to particular measures of the kind you're talking about. Uh, the neoliberal economic arrangements, which were instituted roughly from that time, uh, have as one of, their, you know, one of their main consequences, almost transparent consequence, is to reduce the threat of democracy. Now, you can debate the economic effects. I think they're mainly harmful, but uh, at least that's debatable. But in the case of undermining democracy, it's just transparent. I mean, every single proposal, you can go through it if you want. Uh, and the same is true of many other things. So yes, this is part of it. Uh, there has to be better indoctrination of the young. Uh, well, the young don't have to accept the indoctrination. And with corporatization or anything else, uh, they can continue to be free and uh, challenging and open and so on. Well, like, say, take my own university, for example. In the 1960s, uh, MIT was uh, sometimes called Pentagon University. It was literally almost 100% funded by the Pentagon. Uh, nevertheless, it was the center, the academic center of uh, anti-war resistance, not protest, resistance, organizing resistance. That can be done. And uh, uh, the students were very active and engaged. Uh, if you know things like ZNet, for example, or uh, South End Press and so on, they just are all, all came out of that. Uh, and yeah, that can be done under whatever the conditions are. But the attempts are clear and understandable, and the resistance to them is crucial. I mean, to take a, when you say about awareness, it's certainly true. I mean, unless people in the West know uh, about, say, to pick one case, the uh, breakdown of the Fist Band Treaty and what that entails, unless they know that, unless they know what the reasons are for the current confrontation with Iran, this species is not going to survive very long. So yeah, that's important. Next question. Do you just get one question each, please? Uh, your name, please. Yeah. My name is Piruz Danishmandi. Uh, my question is, would you say that the current wave of uh, populist governments in Latin America would have a better chance of success? Uh, I mean, talking mainly in uh, the governments of Chavez and Morales and so on, would have a better chance of success in standing up to the ag aggression and the bullying of the godfather in the north than their predecessors did, uh, such as the Arbenz government or <coughs> Allende and Sandinistas? I think they have a much better chance for a lot of reasons. Uh, for one thing, because the West has become more civilized. Uh, the uh, kinds of ac actions that the Kennedy administration could carry out without anybody even paying attention, uh, or that the Reagan administration could carry out against substantial protest, it would be much harder in the United States today because the population is much less likely to tolerate it. Uh, the Iraq war was an interesting example. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind that the Iraq war is the first colonial war, basically, in, in hundreds of years of uh, Western history it's the first time that there was ever massive protest against a war before it was officially launched. It's never happened before. It wasn't enough to call it off, but it's a huge step. Uh, furthermore, the fact that the uh, Bush administration uh, constructed such an unimaginable catastrophe in Iraq, I mean, it's a, you know, the failure in Iraq is one of the worst catastrophes in military history, uh, that's sharply reduced their capacity to carry out aggressive action elsewhere. And my own guess, frankly, before the uh, Iraq uh, war, actually I may have said that here in a video conference at the time, but my own guess was that the Iraq war would be over in about three days, uh, that they'd send in a class from the MIT uh, electrical engineering department and get the electricity running again, uh, and they'd probably leave a Salvador-style client state, and then they'd go on to attack the Andes. Uh, that was my guess at the time, but you know, they succeeded in with an amazing combination of uh, arrogance and ignorance and incompetence in converting what should have been the easiest military victory in history into one of the worst military catastrophes in history. So bad that they may actually lose control of Middle East oil. And that's meant that gives space to people elsewhere to carry out actions that would have been very hard otherwise. 
Uh, that's, those are some of the factors, but it's much more than that. Uh, by now, there are substantial, uh, for the first time in its history, uh, Latin America is developing internal contacts of a serious nature. I mean, until now, pretty much Latin America was oriented toward the conquerors. So the countries were, or, I mean, the road systems, the cultural systems, you know, the elites and everything, were oriented towards whatever the Western invader was. For the first time, they're beginning to integrate. It's a slow process, but it's proceeding. There's a South American trade bloc, Mercosur. Uh, Chavez's victory is having a big effect. Uh, the U.S. is horrified by it, can't do much about it. It's very popular in Latin America. It's uh, a winning support, uh, uh, tremendously popular in Venezuela. It's one thing they can do anything about. Uh, they tried with a military coup, had to back off. Uh, and it's having effects elsewhere. The Morales election in Bolivia is another. Uh, throughout South America now, from, from Venezuela down to Argentina, sole exception is Colombia, uh, there's a kind of a ferment going on. Some left center governments. Uh, uh, there's an indigenous movement for the first time, cross national, uh, from Bolivia up to Ecuador mainly, uh, which is calling, some, calling for an Indian nation. Uh, many of them, incidentally, don't, they want to control their own resources, which are substantial, and many of them don't even want those resources to be exploited. So there are plenty of peasants in Ecuador who don't see any reason to have their lifestyle destroyed uh, so that people can drive, sit in SUVs and traffic jams in New York. You know, uh, they have other goals in life. Uh, and this uh, region is uh, it's just getting out of hand. The United States doesn't know how to deal with it, can't deal with it. Uh, furthermore, there are now South-South contacts uh, going well beyond Latin America. So Latin America, South Africa, and India have uh, integrated relationships. Uh, China uh, not only is a major trading partner of the e European Union, maybe the leading trading partner now, but it's also becoming a much greater trading partner with uh, Latin America, particularly Venezuela, but also the other exporters, uh, Brazil and Chile. Uh, and uh, they're beginning to invest, uh, they're supporting, uh, they're presenting a competing force to U.S. power in Latin America, which hasn't existed since the time when the British and the French controlled South America, so since the Second World War. Now, those are big changes in the world. In fact, you know, if you take a look at the whole picture of U.S. policy, uh, the Bush administration has, in fact, driven the United States into an extremely dangerous situation. And you know, it's a kind of a wounded uh, lion, which is the most dangerous kind. You don't know how they're going to react, but the wounds are severe. They are in a p possibly losing control of Middle East oil resources, which would be a, just an incredible disaster for US British planners. Uh, but the same is happening in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, US intelligence had projected back in 2000 that the U.S. would, of course, control the Middle East, but it would rely for itself on more stable resources in the Atlantic Basin. That means West Africa and the Western Hemisphere. Well, the main ones are in Venezuela, and they're now losing. Uh, of course, they're not really losing them, but Venezuela is beginning to diversify its exports. doesn't want to be reliant on the United States. Uh, it's ex exporting China. Uh, same is very likely to happen in Bolivia if things develop, biggest natural gas producer. Uh, the Bush administration has even succeeded in something which is almost inconceivable and takes real talent. They've alienated Canada. You know, I mean, <laughs> like I say, that takes real genius. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Bush administration, in a flat, there were NAFTA conflicts. You know, between Canada and the United States, and the United States lost in the NAFTA courts. So, of course, told NAFTA to get lost uh, and told Canada to get lost. Well, you know, Canada's pretty obedient, but they weren't happy about that. And the Canadian Minister of Resources actually said that Canada might uh, send part of the oil it sends to the United States to China, which is a pretty natural relationship. And that's the second biggest supplier to the United States in the Western Hemisphere, Venezuela the first. Uh, but, you know, the, the consequences of all of this are extremely hard to predict. 
but it's a, a very it's of enormous significance for potential world affairs. But getting back to your original question, yeah, there's a lot of reasons for space for action that didn't exist before. Uh, we have ten more people waiting to ask questions. We've uh, used up our first 15 minutes, and we have another 15 minutes left. Um, the permutations, I leave up to you. Uh, your name, please. My name is Marcelo. I'm from Latin America, and uh, just thank you for being three years ago in Porto Alegre with your wife. And it's an honor to be to have you here. And as a Latin American, just to say that. Um, to see that you go on constant around the world trying to spread this awareness, uh, that my question goes to your latest book, Imperial Ambitions, which is your, our uh, responsibility that we have, our privilege, that if we're talking about these Indians in Latin America, that they somehow they swim out of the colonial history of our problems that we have and we solve it our own way. My question or, or my uh, kind of uh, shock is, is I'm still a student here from DCU and our privilege to be here to, 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 to have all what we have in this Western world, why does it correlate with our responsibility that we have? We have a privilege to do it and how we articulate these things into translating into away from the resistance, away from that resist and what, how we change into a proactive activities into something that we have to change and, and we are that 20% lucky that we are the, 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 the privileged one. Why is not a movement to, to encourage that sparkly that, that we have to wake up sometime? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, people, I mean, probably everybody here, certainly me, uh, come from a very privileged sector of the world and privilege does uh, offer opportunities, and opportunities confer responsibility. I mean, a wealthy, privileged person has responsibilities that go way beyond those of a, a peasant in Bolivia. You know. uh, that's transparent. Uh, so then you have a choice. Uh, will you take up your responsibilities or will you abandon them? Uh, we certainly have them. We have the opportunities. We have the responsibilities. Uh, will we be as uh, courageous about it as, say, uh, peasants in Bolivia or in southern Colombia or you know, El Salvador or any place that's under the jackboot somewhere? Uh, and, but, you know, and there's no answer to that. It's just a choice that we have. You can take up those responsibilities or abandon them. And there are plenty of people who are taking them up. I mean, as most of you know, I'm sure, in a couple of days there will be another meeting of the... Uh, World Social Forum, this time in Caracas. Uh, by now, the World Social Forum has spawned uh, regional and local social forums all over the world. Uh, this is a real mass movement, a popular movement, uh, which has nothing like it in history. And it's the first, it's at least the seeds of the first genuine international. I mean, an international has been the dream of the left and the labor movement since its origins in the modern times. That's why every union is called an international. I mean, they aren't internationals, but that was the goal. There were abortive attempts to form internationals, destroyed mostly internally for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but uh, this one is at least the seeds of a genuine one. Uh, it crosses regional lines, crosses class lines, as peasants, as steel workers, uh, uh, educated you know, professionals uh, uh, working together for pretty common aims with a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of commitment to doing things locally all over the world and getting together uh, in regional conferences by now in several places at the same time uh, regularly. Okay, those are it's the beginnings of real opportunities. How to carry them forward? Well, it's, you know, that point we're back to choice. There's certainly no magic keys about this. I mean, there's no secrets about it that anyone's been keeping from people. Uh, there, it just means a regular, dedicated uh, organizing and educating educational activities and tactics uh, which have to be adapted to whatever the particular circumstances and goals are. There's no formulas for it any more than there has been for making the enormous, winning the privileges we do have. 
I mean, they, they haven't been given by anyone. They've been won by constant struggle. Labor struggle, human rights struggle, women's struggles, and so on. Yeah, you win, you win uh, the privileges. Then you have a legacy and a choice. You can abandon the legacy or you can use it. And it's been that way all through history. It's, 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 that's the way it is now. Hi, um, my name is Conor McGowan and I'm, I'm affiliated to the Irish Socialist Network. Um, tonight's talk is on the quest for survival. Um, in the more personal quest for human survival, uh, many people attempt to enter Ireland to escape torture and desperate poverty. Um, with racism on the rise in Ireland due to, amongst other things, um, the facilitation of open fascists here in the Allen H, our government has succeeded. Our government has succeeded in passing a referendum banning children of no nationals from our country. As an anarchist yourself, and as somebody who expresses anti-elitist views, would you like to comment on why this government will bend over backwards to allow you into Ireland and turn down others whose very survival may well depend on entry into this country? I mean, it's a question that answers itself, so I don't have to answer it. Uh, yeah, you know the answer. The question isn't, you know, it's, we're not looking for an answer. The question is, what do you do about it? I mean, yes, those kind of barriers are going over, up all over the world. Uh, I don't know about Ireland, but they're certainly going up in the United States, European Union, elsewhere. And yeah, they're all uh, really shocking. I mean, the, uh, the barriers and uh, it, it's a very mixed story when you look. Take, say, the United States, the one I know best. Uh, there's pressures from elite groups both to admit immigrants and to ban them, both. They want to admit them because they want cheap, exploitable labor, uh, which will displace uh, uh, domestic labor and reduce their rights and wages. On the other hand, they want to keep them out for racist and other reasons. And so you get a mixture. Uh, so for example, take, say, the border with Mexico, which is the main, you know, the main border that's near permeable. Uh, up until throughout its history, like most borders, it's been a very uh, arbitrary border. Borders are established by conquest. You know, they're not given by God. Uh, and the Mexican border was established by conquest. The U.S. conquered half of Mexico. And it was, a, it was a porous border. Pretty much the same people lived on both sides. They went up and back freely, fairly freely. Uh, it was changed in 1994 uh, when NAFTA was passed, North American Free Trade Agreement, so-called. Uh, when it was passed in 1994, uh, Clinton militarized the border for the first time. Uh, why? Well, because it was anticipated that uh, NAFTA, contrary to pretense, uh, would be a disaster for Mexicans, as in fact turned out to be the case. Not for the rich, you know, a number of billionaires shot way up, but so did the poverty rate. Uh, and it was expected the, it would lead to, uh, the neoliberal measures would lead to an influx of people trying to escape to the north, so they militarized the border. And by now, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's really militarized. People are, hundreds of people are dying trying to get across. Uh, well, you know, the agribusiness, uh, uh, others who want cheap labor, they want them to come across for ugly reasons. But they're the kind of pressures you're talking about to keep them out. Uh, there are struggles going on right where I live in Boston. Actually, my daughter teaches <laughs> nearby colleges, leading some of them. Uh, to try to gain rights, to gain uh, the rights of undocumented immigrants, to gain, to enable their children to go to school. I mean, you know, keeping them out of school is just unbelievable cruelty. I mean, they were brought in to be exploited. Now their children are being kept out of school. It happens to be technically illegal, but getting the universities to obey the law on this is not easy. So yes, these are the kinds of constant struggles that go on everywhere take different forms in different places. I mean, when Spain was invited, in, 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 uh, brought into the European Union, uh, there was a kind of a tacit agreement that part of Spain's obligation would be to be a border police, you know, keep people from North Africa from getting into Europe. Well, Spain wants to agree to that. Uh, 
They can do it. It's not very pretty. And yeah, that's happening everywhere. I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, in biblical times when the prophet Isaiah was making his pronouncements, it was probably a guy like me who was supposed to tell him to, 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 to uh, that we only have five minutes left, but we do only have five minutes left. And I think realistically, we are only going to get through one more question, and I'm very sorry. Uh, uh, do apologize to the other people who've waited so patiently. Uh, last question, please. My name is Hamid Reza Khodobakhshi. I'm affiliated with Dublin Institute of Technology Student Union. Uh, let me just first welcome you on behalf of all DIT students to Dublin, Professor Chomsky, and we hope very much, uh, we hope very much we'd be honored with your presence someday soon in our university. My question is about your speech tonight. You mentioned the elections June, in June in Iran and democracy, which is a very strange word in Iran. Uh, I would just like to get your view about the new president. As you know, he leads a very right-wing government in Iran. And after President Khatami, that he was more liberal and he was more international based uh, on his policies. Like, um, what would be your view on that? And would you think that is beneficial for the country? And would you, how would you be your views be over the military action in Iran from the United States after the new, new election? Well, I, as far as I understand, uh, Ahmadinejad's appeal was on social issues. Uh, he was felt, rightly or wrongly, to be someone who might be concerned with the extreme needs of the poor and oppressed people. And that's where he got the vote from. The reformers, you know, the people who I would prefer on civil rights grounds, uh, themselves conceded that they had lost the population, uh, they, who they weren't speaking for them. I mean, they weren't interested in the issues that the elites were interested in. Uh, they were interested in survival. And Ahmadinejad gave the impression of being, uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, committed to uh, social issues. Incidentally, that's part of the Islamic fundamentalist appeal throughout much of the world. I mean, take groups like uh, Hamas, say, or the uh, radical Islamists in Egypt, or almost everywhere. Uh, whatever you think about their views, uh, they're mostly honest. Uh, they're, they're not extremely corrupt, you know. If a poor person wants, has a sick kid and wants to go to a clinic, uh, they can go to one of the radical Islamists' clinics and they'll be treated. Or they go to a government clinic, you know, if they find a nurse there, they're lucky. And if it is, she's there or a doctor's there, you know, he probably doesn't care anyway. Uh, well, you know, that kind of thing makes a difference over time. It does lead to appeal. Now, that's been a large part of the appeal of this Islamic fundamentalist forces. And I, to the extent that I understand Iran, which is not profound, I should say, I think that's the appeal that Ahmadinejad has had. Uh, on the international scene, he's kind of a disaster for Iran. Uh, but on the, domestically, you can see the basis for the appeal. However, uh, whatever's going on in Iran, you know, that's really not our concern. That's their concern. Uh, what our concern ought to be is why are we pressing Iran in the most dangerous possible direction? For example, in the way that I mentioned, uh, by EU cowardice, European Union cowardice, in refusing to live up to the compact they made with Iran with regard to enriching uh, nuclear materials. I mean, you can't condemn Iran for breaking the bargain if the European Union refuses to accept its part of the bargain under U.S. pressure. And their uh, Iranian demands are very sensible. I mean, if uh, Iran was threatening anyone to the, to the, even to, to a, even anywhere near the extent that the U.S. is threatening Iran, uh, we'd probably think they should be wiped out. You know? I mean, whatever horrible statements Ahmadinejad is making, I suppose that he were adding to it uh, a credible threat to uh, bomb the United States or bomb Israel or carry out terrorist acts within them and was prepare, preparing very visibly to do so and developing capacity to do so. Uh, well, how long do you think he would last in that case? Okay, we know what would happen. That's what we're doing. And the European Union under US pressure is refusing to uh, live up to its firm commitment to deal with the security issues in return for guarantee that there will not be a development of fissionable materials. 
Uh, furthermore, there's the more general problem. Uh, the U.S. alone, with the spear carrier backing it up, uh, have blocked a treaty which would ban further production of fissile materials. Well, you know, in that case, uh, all of these uh, negotiations are kind of meaningless. Um, they're like scotch tape on a cancer. Those are the things we should be concerned about, not the problems of whatever's happening in Iran, because those we can do something about. Thank you. That concludes the questions. Uh, Don't go yet, don't go yet. We still have another, uh, the last part of the program here. Louisa Nieddine and Gerlit Regan will take the platform, please. Sorry, that's, that's definitely not Gerlit Regan. Thanks very much, Declan. There's just a few things we'd like to say before everyone leaves here this evening. Both myself on behalf of the Literary and Historical Society and Neda Suhail on behalf of the Philosophy Society would like to thank a few people without whom this event simply could not have happened. We'd like to thank all the staff in the Philosophy Department in UCD, in particular Maria Bagramian, who has been a constant support to us during the months of planning that went into tonight and who we owe a huge debt of gratitude to. Thanks very much, Maria. We'd like to thank, thank the committees of the Philosophy Society and the Ellen H. We'd also like to thank Ailish O'Brien, Mary Clayton and everyone else in UCD who have been of a huge support, particularly in the last couple of weeks leading up to tonight's talk. We'd also like to thank Caroline and all of the staff in O'Reilly Hall for their help this evening and to Richard Butler, the Society's officer, who has helped us uh, an awful lot, particularly in the last couple of days. We'd also like to thank our guest chair this evening, Mr. De Bradian, and Ned is going to pass him a small token of our appreciation. <laughs> I don't think that we won't go into that. And don't worry, we haven't forgotten you either, Professor Chomsky. We'd like to say a huge thank you to Professor Chomsky for giving up his time here this evening, and we'd like to give him also a small token of our appreciation. also have to do this evening before tonight's events conclude. The Honorary Fellowship of the Literary and Historical Society is an award that is given to individuals who have excelled within their fields of human endeavour. Numerous Nobel laureates and figures from cultural and political life have been awarded this award. However, Professor Chomsky is the only person who is about to be awarded it twice. Uh, the reason for this is because he's just so great and also... Uh, Due to, due to an event that some of you might remember three years ago when the auditor of the 148th session of the Literary and Historical Society, Jarlith Regan, organised a satellite link-up by which Professor Chomsky accepted this award. Um, both myself and Jarlith, who's going to join me on stage now, would like to offer this award again to Mr Chomsky in person um, on behalf of the members and of the committees of the Literary and Historical Society. I'd ask you all to stand once again for Professor Noam Chomsky.
Thank you very much. Um, I, this is the stage where you thank the parish priest for the use of the hall, or in this case, Sir Anthony O'Reilly. Thank you and good night.